There is one phylum of animals that seems to dominate the marine world, inhabiting nearly every ecosystem. From shallow reefs to deep sea vents and the pelagic midwater, the success of mollusks is unparalleled. Nearly 25% of all marine organisms are mollusks, including such oddities as sea snails, nudibranchs and cephalopods, like squid with their specialised tentacles. Even the snails you might find in your garden belong to the mollusks, for this is the only phylum with species found in the sea, freshwater and on land, a testament to their adaptability. With an estimated 85,000 living species known to science, the abundance and diversity of mollusks is what allows them to occupy a great many niches and habitats and diversify into an assortment of shapes and sizes. The smallest mayofauna mollusks grow to just 0.4 millimetres long, while in the pelagic deep they dominate as voracious predators looming out of the dark. This is the alien world of mollusks. The basic body plan of mollusks consists of some unique characteristics. A sheet of tissue called a mantle covers the body. This skin-like organ protects the visceral mass that contains the organs and digestive system and secretes calcium carbonate to form the mollusk's shell. Most mollusks have some kind of foot, a muscular organ that enables mobility. Bivalves, like cockles, use it to burrow into the sediment, while gastropods use it to move along a solid surface. As it brings grazing mollusks, like limpets or abalone, to food, a barbed tongue called a radula scrapes the food off the rocks. The presence of a foot is what enabled mollusks to become so successful, for its morphology could be modified, moulded into specialised appendages as adaptations to their environment. The cephalopods turned their foot into a set of tentacles for capturing prey and manipulating objects, allowing them to take to the open ocean and occupy an entirely new way of life. Free-swimming sea snails, called pteropods, also took to pelagic life by transforming the foot into two wing-like structures called parapodia, allowing them to fly through the water column. These adaptations still use the foot for mobility, but in an entirely different way. But to find success in a range of lifestyles, the nature of the molluscan shell had to change too. Gastropods, like sea snails, have single coiled shells, while Aplicophorans have lost theirs altogether. Coleoids, including the squid and octopus, have internal shells called gladii, or stylets, whereas nautiloids possess air-filled external shells. To better understand how these classes of mollusks differ, we'll take a look at them one by one to discover how they've been able to adapt to a range of environments. The gastropods are the second most diverse class of animals after insects, with over 40,000 living species known to science. The key to their success is their approach to life on the sea floor. While a shell may be a nuisance for pelagic mollusks, it is essential for benthic species. The coiled or conical shells of gastropods are thickened to protect their soft bodies. Some take it a step further. Members of the family Muricidae decorate their shells with spiral ridges and axial varices. The leafy horn mouth has developed three ridges along its shell. These add thickness and texture, preventing the crab from gripping onto the main portion of the shell to break it open. An operculum acts as a door to the shell's opening. It is a bony plate that denies access to predators, but also helps retain moisture within the shell. Its presence has thus helped gastropods to conquer the intertidal zone, a harsh and ever-changing landscape that is submerged at high tide and exposed to the wind and sun at low tide when the sea recedes. Whelks and periwinkles close up the operculum or hide away in rock pools, while limpets, another kind of gastropod, clamp their shells firmly onto rocks to lock in the moisture. The thick, cone-shaped shell and strong muscular foot serve as formidable defence mechanisms at both high and low tide. When submerged, the active limpets spend their time grazing algae on the rocks. But when threatened by predators like starfish, they can be observed using the edge of their shell to fight back, scraping at the tube feet and deterring their attacker. 
The abalone prefers the flight response. Instead of standing its ground like the limpet, it attempts to outrun the predator, using its muscular foot to flee at remarkable speed. When the predator catches up, the abalone resorts to Plan B, using powerful torque to twist its shell and wrench itself free from the attacker's many arms. In the deep sea, around towering hydrothermal vent structures, one species of deep-sea gastropod builds itself a suit of iron armour. At many vent locations, the hydrothermal fluid is rich in minerals, including iron. This reacts with sulphur within the scaly foot snail's body, forming iron sulphide that coats the shell with a strong layer. The snails also build layers of tough iron sulphide scales that cover the foot, providing extra protection from predators and possibly helping them endure the searing temperatures, high pressure, strong acidity and low oxygen levels found at hydrothermal vents. The scaly foot snail is another excellent example of how gastropods have dramatically altered their shells to survive even the most extreme environments. But it seems the shell is not entirely indispensable. With a name literally meaning naked gills in Latin, the nudibranchs are a diverse group of gastropods that lost their shells in favour of alternative defence mechanisms. These sea slugs instead use their coloration for protection. Some opt to blend in with their surroundings, an example of camouflage. Others, however, display bright contrasting colours to achieve the exact opposite effect. They make themselves stand out, advertising to potential predators that they're not worth eating. A behaviour known as aposematism. The poisonous nature of sea slugs can be explained by the phrase, you are what you eat. For example, Sponge-eating nudibranchs assimilate the sponge's chemical defences into their own bodies, making them distasteful. Other nudibranchs feed on hydroids and store their stinging cells, called nematocysts, in their body wall. The bivalve approach to survival involves using the molluscan shell in an entirely different way. Unlike many gastropods, bivalves are not grazers, so they have no need for a large flattened foot or a radula. Instead, they are filter feeders, so use a two-valved hinged shell and often live either in soft sediments or attach themselves to rocks. Those that live in sediments are known as infernal bivalves, and they use their elongated foot to burrow down into the sand or mud. There they remain, extending long siphons to take in and push out water while protected by their hinged shell. But this alone is not enough to deter predators. On the hunt is a moon snail, a predatory gastropod that hunts bivalves. When threatened, these cockles extend their foot and kick with great force, enabling a quick escape from the attacker. But they're not always so lucky. Once a cockle is firmly in its grasp, the moon snail uses its sharp, rasping radula to bore a hole through the shell of the cockle. It can then consume the soft animal within. Gathered in clusters on the rocks, epifaunal bivalves use their foot not for burrowing, but for strength. The foot of oysters secretes a form of natural cement to attach to a surface, often affixing themselves to each other to form extensive oyster reefs. Mussels instead secrete silky fibres called byssus threads in order to loosely attach to a surface. This means they're still able to somewhat drift in the water, absorbing a greater amount of nutrients. In the deep sea, epifaunal bivalves gather around hydrothermal vents or brine pools. These areas of high nutrient production are due to the presence of mineral-rich fluids. Here, Massive mussel beds cover the rocks, providing an extensive reef on which many other organisms rely. The mussels are only able to survive by participating in a symbiotic association with bacteria that live on the dissolved minerals. The bacteria undergo a process called chemosynthesis, producing nutrients from the vent fluids and thus sustaining the mussel population by providing them with food. These mussels endure at the precipice of life and death. In particular, those at brine pools exist in a narrow range between toxic pools of brine, where no life can survive, and the vast barren desert of the abyssal plain. Surviving here is a challenge. 
But once again, the surprising adaptability of mollusks allows them to occupy a difficult niche in a dangerous environment. By far, the most unusual class of mollusks are those that have pushed the limits of their morphology. The basic molluscan body plan has been highly modified. Instead of a radula, a parrot-like beak dismembers prey. The muscular foot has been moulded into a set of arms and tentacles, along with a funnel-like siphon for jet propulsion. Many have become proficient predators, having evolved a well-developed nervous system, complex eyes and a centralised brain. Their long and complex evolutionary history is documented in the fossil record. Of the 17,000 fossil cephalopod species, many like nautiloids, belemnoids, and the well-known ammonoids possessed a chambered shell called a phragmacone. But despite its abundance in the fossil record, there is only one surviving genus that still possesses a phragmacone, the nautiloids. Unlike some gastropods who coil their bodies to occupy most of the shell, the soft body of the nautilus inhabits only the final chamber near the opening. This allows the rest of the shell to be used for buoyancy, containing air-filled chambers joined by an internal tube called a siphuncle. This is what enabled early nautiloids to rise from the sea floor and take to the open ocean, using a funnel to expel water for jet propulsion. Despite this, the nautilus is still perhaps the least specialised of modern-day cephalopods, retaining its simple eye and simple brain. Most modern-day cephalopods have done away with their rigid outer shells altogether. At most, they retain a vestigial internal shell called a cuttlebone or gladius for support. These shellless cephalopods are the coleoids, a subclass that includes octopuses, squid and cuttlefish. Their success relative to the early shelled cephalopods was thanks to their range. By wrapping their mantle around the shell, coleoids could survive the high pressure of deep waters, while nautiloids and ammonoids could not. It was their ability to inhabit the deep that saved early coleoids from being wiped out by the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, the mass extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs and many shelled cephalopods. Remarkably, there is a species of octopus that seems rather out of place among the coleoids. This is the Argonaut octopus. At first look, it seems to resemble the nautiloids discussed earlier with a narrow spiral shell protruding from its back. But there's more to this octopus than meets the eye, for the structure it carries is not a true shell, but a brooding chamber. An egg case that the female produces to carry around juveniles as they develop, secreting the chamber from two dorsal chambers rather than the mantle. As there's no siphuncle, as in the nautilus shell, the female traps a bubble of air in the chamber to keep afloat and sheds the structure once her young have developed. Another coleoid that doesn't seem to fit in can be found lurking in the deep waters of the mesopelagic zone. This is the vampire squid. With thin webbing connecting each of its arms and small fins projecting from the mantle that it uses to swim, the vampire squid looks to be a mix between octopus and squid. In truth, it's neither, and instead belongs to its own order called Vampyromorpha, being the only known species to be classified in this group. Not only is the vampire squid not a squid, it's also not a bloodsucker. It's a filter feeder, extending string-like filaments to capture and eat bits of dead organisms and feces that slowly sink to the bottom as marine snow. Mollusks are a phenomenal example of how marine phyla can harness their environment to maximise diversification. The range of habitats, niches and lifestyles they occupy owes itself to the remarkable ways in which mollusks have morphed and modified their most basic features into complex and highly specialised tools. The arms and tentacles of cephalopods, the parapodia of pteropods, allowing snails to take to the open, the burrowing foot of bivalves, 
The result of such staggering evolution is a phylum that dominates the deep sea, the open ocean, the shallows, and even the land. Thanks to their mastery of adaptation, mollusks truly are specialists of survival.